So yeah, um, another topic that is really on people's minds these days um, is the, the paedophilia cases that are going on around the world, particularly in Australia. Um, because even though, yeah, there are cases in the UK and in, in America and, of course, every country worldwide, you know, inevitably, Australia really seems to be taking the bull by the horns with this one, you know, and uh, exposing this, this horrible, sordid underbelly. Um, of the the Watchtower Tract and uh, sorry Watchtower and Bible Tract Society that people have for so long put their implicit trust in, you know, and you know it's strange because with the uh, the the Russia issue um, that the, the Russians have banned Jehovah's Witnesses, they've labelled them as extremists, they've put them on the same par as uh, ISIS and Nazis and people of that that kind. Um, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of hoo ha about it in the corrugations and on the on, on the JW sites and in the JW broadcasting, the governing body is really going to town on this one. It's all about Russia. It's all about the bans. And you know, it's quite sad, even with that. Um, it's, it's been noted, actually, sadly, that the governing body seem to be slightly more concerned with the fact that Russia has confiscated the Kingdom Halls and, you know, the sort of the wealth and stuff like that, more than the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses themselves, the men and the women, the children, the elderly, all these brothers and sisters are actually now, you know, they're living in fear. Their lives have been turned upside down. I mean, it must not be easy to be told all of a sudden, um, you know, after probably months or years of, of anticipation and hope that it wouldn't happen. It must be awful, really, to be told that um, you can't be a witness anymore. You can't worship or live your life anymore because, you know, that's... Nobody wants that. I mean, it's a basic human right to be able to believe in whatever crap you want to believe in and do what you want within reason. But it's funny because the Russia thing is given the spotlight. And it's obvious why. It's because it's it's sort of condemning something that Jehovah's Witnesses can, you know, unrefutedly say, or unrefuted or whatever the word is, that they can say without a shadow of a doubt, let's say, that that is, um, that is really attacking something that is good. Something that no one can really argue with, especially when it comes to the Human Rights Act and whatever. You know, no one can really argue against it. Um, so that they have no shame and, and no uh, reservations about talking about that kind of thing and defending it and condemning the Russian government for from banning them. And they have a lot of support. Um, the United Nations started to be a bit uh, worried. I, I know that, I think it was the... Um, the Telegraph or The Guardian in the UK came up with a big article about it saying, um, should the UK be worried um, about Russia's banning of the witnesses because it sets a precedent, you know, if, if Jehovah's Witnesses can be banned on the basis of their religious beliefs, well then, who else can be banned? And for what purpose? For what reason? You know, it could be anything. So Russia is getting all the hoo-ha. But when it comes to this, uh, the sex abuse cases um, in, in, in Australia, in the UK, in the US, and who knows where else, you know. The governing body has been stum on that subject. It's not in the watchtowers. It's not mentioned in, in the corrugations. We are not asked to pray for victims in the prayers. Like we are, we've been asked, we've literally been asked to pray for um, the, the government officials. I mean, for goodness sake, they're actually literally asking us to pray that Putin, of all people, will change his mind. I don't think there's much chance of that happening, but hey-ho, they want us to pray anyway. Oh dear. So when it comes to this Russia, uh, this um, this this Australian Royal Commission Commission thing, um, nothing much has been said about it. In fact, as a final uh, insult to the victims, uh, you know, a kick below the belt, as it were, the governing body remains silent, and then suddenly re re released, a, you know, a well-timed statement reaffirming their view on the two witness rule. And basically stubbornly saying, we are not budging on this subject. We don't care how much it's going to cost. We don't care how many people leave the truth. We don't care how much reproach it brings on Jehovah's name. We don't care. We're not going to budge. And that's strange, you know, because I remember reading somewhere that um, with the whole political and war stance... Jehovah's Witnesses are typically told that um, when it comes to war and stuff like that, we cannot change our minds. We must refuse to do anything, even the alternative service. We must stand there and say no. And then the rules changed and people were allowed to do alternative service. And I think it was in Ghana or Gambia or someplace. 
Uh, to gain legal status, the Jehovah's Witnesses had to concede on the war thing or something. And they decided, OK, let's do it then. To get legal status, fine, we'll compromise. And that kind of thing surprised me. I thought, well, what? I thought Jehovah's Witnesses weren't supposed to co compromise, not for man's laws. God's laws are paramount. So when they did, it made me wonder. Do they have these laws <clears throat> and they can they can change their mind if they want to at any point and, you know, still remain in, in a good conscience or be able to justify with biblical things? And it's just a fact of them not wanting to, unless they, they will gain something in return, like they'll get their legal status or they'll win a battle or, you know, a legal battle or something. So when it comes to this two-witness rule, I have complete confidence that the Jehovah's Witness organisation, anyway, the governing body, they can change that in the blink of an eye if they want to. But the fact that they're not going to, and they've been so arrogant and stubborn about it, to me really shows the attitude of the men in charge of this organisation. And this again, when it comes to figuring out is this a false religion or not, I have to take it back to, to the Bible itself. Now, what do Jehovah's Witnesses claim? They claim that they are Jehovah's Witnesses. They belong to Jehovah God, the Almighty. But they are also Christians. And to be a Christian means to be a follower of Christ. You are Christ-like. The Bible says that Christ has, has left us a model to follow his steps closely or something of, of that way. And so th their, their main concern when it comes to who to imitate is Jesus Christ himself. Now think about it. Let's hypothetically say that uh, when Jesus was alive, I mean, what, how did Jesus view children? How did kids view him? Well, we know from the scriptures that uh, Jesus was remarkably approachable, especially for people of that age, especially for a person who was revered. I mean, he would talk to anyone, to unclean people, to people who had diseases, to people who were disabled, you know, and they were kicked out of their communities, to the Pharisees, to the tax collectors, to that woman who had a flow of blood and no one would even touch her, you know, to all these people, to people who believed in God and people who didn't, the people that society hated and the people, people that society viewed as unclean. He would talk to them anyway. He didn't care. And when it came to children, it said that Jesus Christ was so approachable that the kids were flocking to him. And the apostles, because of course they were they were brought up with these more arrogant views, and which Jesus had to continuously remind them and sort of bring them up short about. They sort of went, "Don't bother the Lord now with your you know childish concerns. He has bigger things to worry about. You know, like the salvation of mankind. Take the children away and don't bother Jesus." And we know that Jesus basically said, "You know, don't say that kind of thing. Bring the kids to me." You know, and the Watchtower has always said. You know, the children could sense that Jesus was a good man. Now, that's not really true, okay? K kids will, I mean, you know what children are like. A, a guy says, do you want to see some puppies in my van? And the kids think he's a nice guy, so they follow him. Kids don't really have that kind of judgment, you know? Otherwise, we'd use them, you know, to, to sniff out criminals, you know, in prisons and stuff like that. So we know they can't do that. What they really should say is children can tell when somebody's interested in them. And especially when it comes to grown-ups, because typically grown-ups are too busy. They're kind of un uh, un unrelatable for a child. They're unreachable. They're these big giants that walk around in suits and ties and business wear, talking about things kids don't understand, using gadgets and things that the kids don't understand yet until, you know, they're about two years old or something. And, you know, grown-ups are, are people that, that kind of tolerate children. But Jesus was somebody that, that talked to children like they were people, and the kids loved him. So now we know what Jesus thinks of children, that he respects them, he loves them, he, he regards them as little people, and he cares about them. Now let's say hypothetically that one of the apostles, I mean we already know Judas was a bad egg, so let's, let's assume it's him. Let's imagine Judas, as well as being a betrayer, was a bit of a paedophile. Let's imagine that now that all the children are flocking to Jesus and the parents are trusting Jesus and the apostles with their kids and feeling safe enough to leave them there, maybe, or at least take their eyes off them. Let's imagine Judas takes a child away and molests him or her. The child is upset. The child tells mom and dad or Jesus or somebody. And Judas and the child obviously were alone. So no witnesses except for the child and the person accused. Now, I asked my mother this because she was very scared and didn't want to talk about this, this pedophilia thing at all. But I just tried to get her to reason this way. 
How would Jesus treat the person accused, especially if it were one of his apostles, one of the highest ranking people who were representing not just Jesus, but Jehovah's you know, uh, views and um, values as well? What would he do to such a person? And my mom said he would throw him out. And I said, yeah, but what if there was just, you know, just a child and that person, Judas or one of the other disciples or whatever? My mom was like, well, you know, Jesus would make sure that they were gotten rid of. So I said, when it comes to the governing body then, and they not only suspect certain brothers of being paedophiles, but they know they are because they've actually had admissions and confessions by the man himself in the presence of elders and their victims, which is disgusting, of course, we know. And that person has actually confessed to touching a child or raping a child. And this is not just children either, by the way. Let us not forget and ignore that the, the many, many women and, and men and, and other people who have also been raped or sexually abused or molested or whatever. And they have also been ignored. And even now they're being ignored. The focus is on the children, which is fine. But let us not forget these other people you know, who've been raped or whatever, and the elders just dismiss them. Well, my mom sort of realised then that something that I was saying sort of rang true. Because after all, the, the organisation is based on what Jesus would do. You know, there's that sort of saying in the world now, you know, what would Jesus do? So what would Jesus do now if, if he walked into the governing body headquarters without announcement? He just walked in. The governing body are pouring over that register that they apparently have of uh, sexual offenders who they know are sexual offenders, who are still elders and ministerial servants and publishers. How do you think they would feel if Jesus Christ himself walked into that room and knew that they were looking at that register? And he knew that little children and grown up people have actually left the truth and feel that they can't have a relationship with Jehovah anymore, or maybe don't even believe in him anymore, their faith is gone, their, their spirit is low, all because of these elders who act on orders from the governing body, who know exactly what they're doing. Do you think the governing body would be proud and fine and be like, come in, Jesus, you know, we recognise you, come and take a look at this, you know, this kiddie fiddler, fiddler list and see what you think? Or do you think they would actually be rather embarrassed? Do you think that the enormity of what they've done would hit them in the presence of Jesus himself? Or do you think they would suddenly remember that Jesus Christ loved children and that he protected them? Or do you think they would still be arrogant? And it's funny because I said to uh, my mom, obviously the reason that the reasoning the governing body are using <coughs> that they're not budging on because they, they claim that they're basing their stance on Bible principles, which, you know, all the Jehovah's Witnesses will instantly wilt away because if it's Bible-based, we can't question it. So the governing body are claiming that the Bible is the reason they can't budge. Now, the two-witness rule um, is stated where it says that if somebody is accused of a crime, two or more brothers or you know members of the congregation must accuse that person of the same thing. Otherwise, you know, potentially, you could have certain brothers who are just mean and they tell on another brother a lie. And that person gets punished or thrown out for nothing. Yeah, that could happen. I mean, potentially that could happen with two witnesses. Or three, or ten. It's not uncommon. People do lie and, and can conspire with each other. But the governing body uses this, this silly reasoning anyway to discredit victims of sexual abuse purely on that basis. And they allow the person accused to continue serving in the congregation, working with other children, to sit next to that victim potentially at the meetings. They don't care. Even if that brother has a reputation, they don't care. Even if they get a creepy vibe, they don't care. Even if they can see in his face he's guilty, they don't care. Back he goes. And the victim is left to, to sort her or his own life out and leave if they want or stay if they want. And we don't care about you either. Now, I just I honestly don't get the reasoning with this because in, in the scriptures themselves, it has an illustration of... um in the Old Testament, of what to do <clears throat> if a woman is raped in a field by, by a single man, you know, a singular man, one person. Now, it says that if she screams and nobody hears her, so she's assaulted anyway, that that man is to be stoned to death or executed or something. And when, my, when I told my mom this, you could see the, the, the spark of understanding in her eyes and that horrible recognition that what I'm saying is true and that what the governing body are doing doesn't make any sense. 
Because I said, how many witnesses does that verse state have to be present? Well, none, except for the person who was assaulted. And yet, what was the punishment for that person? Death. Were there any other conditions? Did it have to be a sign from God? Did it have to do like a ritual or a special dance or something? No. The person accused that person of raping her, and then that man was put to death. No two witness rule. And you know, the funniest thing is, that scripture is specifically talking about rape. Is that because Jehovah knows with his infinite wisdom, and to be honest, even a retard could figure this out. Someone with two brain cells could understand this. Sexual assaulters, rapists and molesters rarely commit crimes with an audience. It makes sense. It's easy to lure prey away from people and assault them in private. Otherwise, you get caught. Otherwise, people see and stop you or report you or arrest you or beat you up. And besides, even if there are people watching in that sense, then it's usually people who are contributing or are getting a kick out of watching this or it's like a gang rape or something. But Jehovah knows as well as anybody else that sexual assaulters rarely commit crimes in front of other people. It's usually private, especially when it comes to children. They're often groomed for months, maybe years, before an attack takes place. And then it's all about mind control and guilt and fear afterwards. A child may not say a single thing until they're an, an adult about something. But pertaining to that, that scripture, which is specifically talking about rape and sexual assault, it actually states that you, you don't need any witnesses at all. It's the word of the woman against the man and she wins and he dies, as, as should be the case. And when I said that... I, I, my mother's face, you should have seen it, it was a picture. She just couldn't, like, all of a sudden it was like, oh no. This is the Bible that is saying this. The governing, bi the governing body are also using the Bible, but th what they're talking about doesn't make sense. And let's see the result of their reasoning. What has the result of their reasoning been? Is it the protection of the congregation? Is it the vindication of Jehovah's holy name? No, it's the opposite. Thousands of children, thousands of women and men and other people have been sexually abused, raped, molested by people in the congregation, even elders, ministerial servants and goodness knows who else. And what has the result been of that? Well, sexual abuse victims are often discredited by the elders, treated like, like idiots, uh, degraded, they are you know, aggressively, invasively interrogated and often they either give up or they leave the truth. Or they have to, I mean, I read somewhere that um, if a brother accused of sexual assault is disfellowshipped for that accusation, I mean, they, won't, they still won't go to the police, but they'll disfellowship him. Let's say after six months, they reinstate him because according to the elders, he's repentant now. And don't forget, they, they view sexual assault as a sin, not exactly as a crime that has to be paid for by the law. It's just a sin. You know, like masturbation is a sin. Okay, well, I'm sorry for wanking off. I better pray now and be repentant and then I'm cured. But when it comes to uh, sexual assault, they view it the same. It's just a sin. It's just something you did. You offended Jehovah. As long as you make it up with Jehovah, that, that's what really counts. Not the child or the woman or person that you've, you've ruined their life. Who cares about them? That's something they have to be cured for in the new system if they make it that far. If not, boo-hoo. But I read that if a brother is reinstated after being found guilty of sexual assault of a minor or, or a grown-up person, the victim is encouraged or even instructed to forgive that man. Because the elder's reasoning is, if Jehovah can forgive them, because don't forget, when you're reinstated, as far as they're concerned, any, any uh, sins you committed prior to that are automatically forgiven. How they figure that out, I don't know. But they say that because Jehovah has forgiven this person, so must you. Ha! <laughs> Who says that to an abuse victim? That you have to go up to that brother and almost apologise for ruining his life. I'm very sorry I accused you of sexual assault even though you were guilty. I'm sorry for making a fuss and getting you disfellowshipped. I forgive you. And please forgive me too. Let's be friends. No one says that. How can you do that to somebody? And this kind of reasoning, it just doesn't make any sense, you know? If the governing body didn't claim to be spirit-guided uh, and they didn't claim to be Christ-like or anything, then I wouldn't have anything to say because that's up to them what they want to do. 
But the very fact that they are claiming to be like Christ and they are claiming to be uh, directed by Jesus and the Holy Spirit and Jehovah and their actions are approved by Jehovah. And don't forget, they also say that the light is getting brighter, which means that they have more technically more approval now than back in 19 whatever when or the 1800s when they first started out with, with Charles Taze Russell. Because, you know, according to them, that was at like the Dark Ages, even though it was like 100 years or more ago. That was at the Dark Ages. Now we're, we're near the end. Armageddon is nearly here. Well, how much more spiritual enlightenment do you need? Do you really need to be spiritually enlightened to realise that, that the treating abuse victims like this is not a good idea? That it causes permanent damage to their lives? It's ridiculous. I just don't see how this, this organisation is, is truly Christ-like. Because I can't imagine that if Jesus Christ himself came back in the flesh and took the helm, as it were, at, at the governing body at, at Bethel, that I can't imagine that he would still say this two-witness rule is a good idea. That imagine if all the, the abused children come up to Jesus. What, what could he say to them? Oh, so hi, kids. It's nice to meet you. Sorry that brother raped you, uh, Johnny. I'm sorry that brother raped you, Sally. Well, never mind, eh? Back on the ministry you go. Don't let it ruin your, uh, your view of the organisation now. Off you go. Here's your Bible. Bye-bye. I don't think so. Somehow I just can't imagine that. I can't imagine Jesus patting the head of little Johnny who got molested or little Sally who was raped and then goes over to shake the hand of the brother who did it because he was reinstated. I can't imagine Jesus doing that. I just can't imagine him doing that. So what is wrong? Either the Bible's depiction of Jesus is totally wrong, which we, we think it isn't if the Bible is in fact divinely inspired, um, or the organisation who is... Uh, which is led by imperfect men who have often proven to be selfish, grasping, arrogant men who get things wrong many times, not even by accident, but deliberately preach uh, false information. They're wrong. Which is more likely? The divinely inspired book, which is perfect, or the imperfect organisation of greedy men? I mean, we say power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Now, the elders have power, and we all know they're corrupt. So what about the absolute uh, leaders in, in this organisation, the governing body? By that very logic that I think it was Ab Abraham Lincoln or somebody said that, somebody with a brain anyway. And by if we really believe that, which is kind of evident, honestly, in this world that we live in, that if, if, if petty officials like the, the elders, who honestly don't have that much power in comparison to the governing body who influence everything, if they can be corrupted... Then what about the leaders, the absolute powers? Well, they're absolutely corrupted. They're the people responsible for ruining lives, driving people to suicide, to depression, leaving people with PTSD and all these other incurable conditions. And it's like, how can you do that with a clear conscience? How does the governing body sleep at night, knowing that the cries and the screams of abused children and women and men all across the world are all directed towards them? They're screaming to the governing body for help. Help us, protect us, change your policy, take care of these, these rapists, get rid of them, report them to the police, get them locked away. And the governing body put their fingers in their ears, they turn over in bed and they go to sleep humming kingdom songs. And they wake up the next day, they have their breakfast, they read the texts and comments, they write new literature and out they go. How can you live like that? Well, anyway, that's my rant about the paedophilia cases. I mean... The fact that, that, that abuse victims are discouraged from speaking up, that they're, that they're treated so disrespectfully and, and cock-handedly, uh, I just kind of comp comprehend it, honestly. I can't comprehend how people stay in that religion. I mean, I just saw a video on YouTube of uh, a woman, I think she's called Cool Girl something something, and um, she went to, the, to one of the conventions this year, I think, the Don't Give Up one, I think that's what the one she went to. And she stood outside and very respectfully, and she was quite nice, I thought she was really cool actually. Um, she stood there and she was calling out to the people waiting in the, in the queues um, for whatever about the paedophilia thing. And she was saying, you know, this is really happening. And you're all turning your backs on her and they were all, you know, turning their backs on her. They were ignoring her. The brothers were coming up to being intimidating to her and, and trying to make her believe that she had no right to be there, even though she did. I mean, they hate smart people. They hate people that know the law because suddenly they, they don't know what to say. All Jehovah's have is the law. It's funny, actually, because they use the law when it suits them. 
about not filming or whatever. Um, but when it's coming to them breaking the law, they have this arrogant attitude that, no, we can do what we want. We are above the law. That's cute. Maybe next time they call the police on somebody who's annoying them or harassing them, maybe the police should say that to them. I thought you guys were above the law, therefore you don't recognise our authority. We don't have to help you. Deal with it on your own. Goodbye. Yeah, it's, it's very... It's, it's super messed up. But it's like... I remember when I was a kid and a teenager... I had weird vibes of certain brothers in my hall. Now, again, I've mentioned this before, I'm not saying those brothers are paedophiles or whatever, but what I'm saying is, back when I was a child, when, when you get these vibes from certain men in the corrugations, creepy vibes. I mean, there was a guy, we used to call him Flirty Frank. That was just his name. All the sisters hated him. He was like a creep or something. He was buzzing around you. He'd flirt with me when I was a teenager. And then five minutes later, he'd be flirting with my mother. And we all detested him, you know, he's a right slimy creep. And he was a corrugation hopper, you know, he'd, he'd be in one corrugation, then he'd move to another one, and it was like he was trying to be flirty and weird and, and then not get caught, you know. So he was one of those people. And nobody trusted him as far as they could throw him. And with those kind of people, you tell yourself, when you get a bit uncomfortable or afraid even, you say to yourself, there is no way... That Jehovah God would allow paedophiles or weirdos or assaulters or dangerous people to be in the congregation as brothers. There's no way. We are told and reassured that Jehovah loves his people. We are his sheep. The elders, their whole job is to protect us. That's their number one mission. That's why we call them shepherds. The shepherds protect and guide the sheep. They don't let the wolves eat the sheep and then blame the sheep for getting eaten. That's stupid. So we're told that, that we're safe. We're given that false sense of security. You know, everything is fine, the corrugation. I mean, they often refer to it as a safe haven where we can leave our, our, our belongings on the chairs and not worry about them. And, you know, people can come in and learn about God and it's safe. Our little children can go and run off and make new friends. We don't care. And so when it comes to these, the, these cases that the lids have been blown off them, the, the horriblest feeling for me was realising that even though it could be true or not, I don't know, but when I used to use the reasoning that a person couldn't possibly be a paedophile because Jehovah was, you know, organising everything and directing everything and overseeing everything in Jesus too, through the elders and everything, I realise now that's not the case. That brother so-and-so, flirty Frank, or, you know, creepy Charlie, or whoever, these people potentially could be paedophiles. We can no longer use the reasoning that, that they simply can't be because they're witnesses. We can't say that anymore. So next time people go to a convention or an assembly or any sort of meeting at all, especially a new one, Instead of thinking to themselves, here we are, we're in, a, we're in a nice, safe Kingdom Hall, the horrible world of Satan is outside, there we can relax. You can't relax. You cannot relax. How can you possibly relax when you know that potential paedophiles are sitting in this congregation right now, that that brother shaking your little boy or girl's hand, how, how do you know he's not a paedophile? I mean, I wonder how many parents have suddenly become horribly afraid and paranoid now with this revelation that paedophiles are freely walking about in Kingdom Halls and assemblies right now on the ministry. I wonder how many mothers and fathers are thinking of all the occasions they've let their son or daughter go on the ministry alone with a particular brother, to be in the car with him on their own, to go to his house to play with his children on their own. How many kids have slept over certain brothers' houses because they're best friends with that brother's son or daughter? I wonder how many parents are thinking about that now and are thinking, hmm, I'm scared. How many parents have wondered, oh, my child came home crying that one time and wouldn't tell me why. What if he was molested? What if she was raped? I wonder if these thoughts are going through parents' heads because no, no longer can they simply say to themselves, no, that would never happen, and then turn over and sleep. How could you do that? Your own instincts as a parent are telling you that danger lurks everywhere. And it's, it's funny, it reminds me of the scripture where it says that Satan, it transforms himself into an angel of light. And that also he's, he's prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking to devour someone. And it's like, 
how they think that Satan isn't smart enough to disguise himself as an angel of light, like a true religion, I don't know. How they think that after all this evidence, that this could still be uh, a Jesus-led, Christ-like corrugation, I don't know. Because we know that Jesus Christ would not sit up in heaven and watch little children be raped and abused under his watch. Because as the head of the corrugation, ultimately, big things like this are his responsibility. Therefore, if, if these things go unchecked and people's lives are ruined, we could put it on Jesus and say, hey, he dropped the ball. Did he just not notice? Or did he ignore, which is worse? So yeah, it's something to think about. And for all the Jehovah's Witnesses out there who are sneakily listening to this, you know, I hope there are at least a few. Because really, you're the, you're the ones that need to hear all this stuff. Because you won't hear this on, online, you won't hear it on the broadcast or the elders. I'm pretty sure that no one's discussing this because it's not something people have to talk about. It's only going to lead to the same conclusions that I've just said. And then people obviously think, oh, apostate, apostate, better stop talking about this now. So if you are listening and everybody else who may be tuning in, hopefully, um, just think about it to yourselves, you know. As Christians, we have to think to ourselves, what would Jesus do? You know, would he be um, indecisive here? Would he not take action? You know, would he or wouldn't he? Does he really love children and people who are vulnerable or abused or potentially going to be abused? How does he think about this? How does he think about people who are sexually immoral and abusive? You know, how does he think about people who disregard Jehovah's laws? How does he think about people who abuse others? He said that he looked at the people and wept, and he saw that they were like uh, sheep without a shepherd, thrown about, skinned and thrown about, he said, tossed by the waves, going hither and thither, didn't know where to go, what to think. And he cried, he said he felt pity for people who were like that. So what about children and, and others who are at the mercy of these wolf-like ones in the congregation? Do you think Jesus cares more about the wolves or more about the sheep? Which is his responsibility? Which ones belong to Satan and which ones are heartfelt people who deserve Jehovah's respect and love and protection? Who do you think needs the new world more? Abused children and women and men? Or abusers? I mean, for goodness sake, if we care more about abusers than victims, what's the point of Armageddon? What is Armageddon going to do? Destroy the victims? Okay, they're, they're, all, they're all dead now. They're all shutting up now. Now we don't have to have a case. Everything's solved. Everybody carry on with your lives. So think about it, you know. This paedophilia thing has really blown the lid off for me, honestly. It's like, it's, it's, it's a driving nail because we read in the Bible, it says, everyone get out of Babylon. It says, get out of it, my people lest you share in her sins. And that, that scripture is talking about false religion, right? Babylon represents false religion in the Bible. And so therefore, it's saying that no matter how good a religion is, what they do for charity or, you know, whatever, if they do terrible things unrepentantly, it's in their policy or their doctrine, then if you are a member of that organization or church or religion or whatever, you are supporting what they are doing. It's either financially, it's either, you know, face value, your tenants, the fact that you proclaim that you're one of them or whatever. You are supporting them. And the Bible makes it very clear. It says, get out of her, my people, because what happens to Babylon the Great? She's devoured, she's killed, she's destroyed, you know, and that's the end of false religion. And people can be destroyed for merely being associated with that religion. They don't even have to be rapists or, you know, fraudsters or anything like that. As long as they support that religion, they are just as culpable as anyone else. And that's, that is what struck my conscience about the witnesses. How can I support an organisation that has a policy that means that children and women and men are abused and raped and they are the ones who are thrown out? And the abusers are allowed to walk free and continue or have a life and not be punished. My own conscience struck me and I thought, no, the Bible says clearly that when there is a, an organisation that is corrupt, we should get out of it. And that is very clear. So that, that is what sort of um, motivated me to finally say, you know, this is, this is the end for me. You know, how can I be part of an organisation like that and have a clear conscience because I couldn't? How can a person go on the field service and invite people into the Kingdom Hall wondering if brother so-and-so maybe maybe be a paedophile and you have to invite a, 
a member of the public and their kids to the hall. Could you do it? Because I couldn't. I really couldn't. Not with a clear conscience, I couldn't. Because if something happened to one of their kids, I would be responsible at the end of the day for knowing that there's potential danger and inviting that person in anyway. So it's not worth it. It's not good. It's not Christian. It's not Christ-like. And so if you are listening to this and you, you are still in the religion or, you know, on the fence about leaving or whatever, think about this very carefully. You know, compare with, with what the Bible says. And don't forget, the Bible doesn't just say about abiding by the law. It says abiding by the spirit of the law, which means, you know, the principle of these scriptures. What, it, what are they really telling us to do in our life? Think about it, meditate on it, pray to Jehovah about it and make a decision. You know, take your time, think about it. And, and don't shy away from the horrible facts and the horrible possibilities because sadly these have come true for many people and their stories are out there and their voices are finally talking out loud and as much as the governing body would like to shut them up thankfully they can't, not now anyway. So let's wait and see. I sincerely hope that everyone who has made a claim against the uh, the people who've abused them and the watchtower and everything will get justice, that would be great and uh, let's see. But yeah, thank you everybody for listening to my to my rants again. I um, hope I haven't been talking too fast. If you have any comments or suggestions or feedback, or if you disagree or you do agree or whatever, comments, shoot me a message. I don't know, just do so, start a discussion because the witnesses hate that, you know. Discussions about this kind of thing are forbidden. So just do it, for goodness sake, you know, just get out there. And again, my usual message, if you, you are in fact an elder or a witness here looking for ammunition or evidence or whatever, please just jump off a window or something because we don't want you here. You know, go and get a life. Go go and read the Bible or something because people like you are just, just as bad as these censoring countries and whatever. You, you're just policemen, you know, scouring the internet for a... For potential arrests and whatever so please just go away you're not doing any good so but to everybody else thank you very much for listening and uh tune in again sometime peace out